Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to tonight's MLA Productivity and Profitability webinar. My name is Hilary and I work for the Webinar Coordinators Aggregate Consulting. Tonight we're joined by Tim Prance of T. Prance Rural Consulting in South Australia to talk us through preferential clovers to sow in southern pastures and their management, establishment and management. Just a bit of housekeeping to get started. You should see this control panel, which will be at the top right hand corner of your screen. The red arrow button on the left collapses and reinstates the control panel. You should be able to hear us, but we cannot hear you. As Tim goes through the webinar, please type your questions in the box provided. I will relay them to him at the end of the webinar. Please make your questions as succinct as possible so I can relay them to Tim uh, and he should be able to answer them uh, at the end. Just a little bit on our presenter for this evening. Uh, Tim is a consultant working with clients to improve their pasture and grazing management and livestock production from pastures. He has 47 years experience farm consulting across both dry land and irrigated farms in South Australia, Victoria and Tasmania. He is the past president of the Grassland Society, Society of SA and he also managed pasture-based research projects and published the results in refereed journals. We're very, very lucky to have Tim here with us this evening. I will make you the presenter, Tim. Okay, we're ready to rip, are we? Yeah, that should pop up on your screen now. Uh, so I go to show my screen. Perfect. How's that looking? Excellent. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Well, thank you. Thank you, Hilary, and good evening, uh, everyone. Um, but tonight I'm going to focus on subclovers. I know I'm well aware there are balances, balancer clovers and Persian clover, as well as arrow leaf clover and white clover, red clover, strawberry clover, cerradella, rose clover. Um, but I time doesn't really permit me to talk about all of those and so I will focus on 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 subclover because I think really at the end of the day subclovers are probably the most persistent and productive pasture legumes in my opinion anyway in for the southern areas of Australia. Um, just to um, just by way of differentiation I should and you're probably aware of this but I'll just emphasize that we've got three different and distinct families of subclover. So the traditional subclover, which is the black seeded sub that's suited to acid soils is the Trifolium subterranean. And that's, you know, your Mount Barker, Woodgee, Seton Park, Narra Cup, Coolerman, Journey, those type. Then there's the Trifolium the uninicums, which are the white seeded subclovers, which are suited to really to only to waterlogged, acidic to slightly alkaline soils, and that's your Trichala, and Riverina. And the last family of subclovers are your Brachycalicinums, which are the clear types. That's the black seeded subs that are suited to heavier alkaline to slightly acidic soils. So it's a clear Mintero and Antas. Uh, I will talk a bit more about the Brachys because there's some quite exciting two new varieties of Brachy that have come out that look pretty exciting. Um, just there's a lot of, um, I, I'm not going to talk too much about um, uh, subclover variety or clover varieties, but if you want to know more about them, um, you go to, if you go to that um, site on the MLA website and then hit the, uh, if I'll just go back, if I can without bring myself up here. Um, yeah, if you go and then, if you go to that website, there the MLA website, and go to Extension and Training Tool, Extension Training and Tools, and there's a drop-down box that says uh, Pasture Tools. And then under that Pasture Tools, there's there's the Pasture Trial Network results. And if you go into that Pasture Trial Network site, there's there's uh, I'll just hit it again. There's um, there's a, there's only there's five five sites there that was, there's been some quite um, good work done on subclover variety evaluation and you'll get quite a you'll get three years of information on um, 
on a range of varieties, and that's all done under controlled situations, much like the uh, serial uh, variety testing scheme that GRDC run. Um, they, these trials are not grazed, but you will get an idea of the productivity of different varieties and the time of the year when it's when the pasture is being produced. I'll just get out of that. The other site that I um, find quite useful is is the um, uh, the Australian Seeds Federation site. So if you go onto that uh, website there, and there's a pasture seed database you'll see there on the front page. And if you go into that database, there's a list of of all the subclovers and just a listing of varieties and it's an indication whether they are public varieties or proprietary varieties. If they're proprietary varieties, the name of the company that markets them is listed as well. Um, and these varieties are listed in order of maturity. So you can pick from that you know, early, you determine whether they're early maturing, mid-season or late maturing. So that's quite a good little website. Um, I so when you're buying seed, I really emphasise the importance of sowing certified seed to minimise the chances of introducing oestrogenic clovers uh, into your paddocks. Um, and the oestrogenic clovers, so particularly the black seeded clovers, Geraldton, Guaragan up and Dinan up, and the white seeded in Indicum Yalup are really prolific seed producers and hard seeded and are a common contaminant in uncertified seed. So if you're buying uncertified seed, you've got a good chance of unwittingly introducing these varieties into your pastures. And once they're there, they're quite hard to eliminate. As I think um, Kevin Foster is giving a webinar in a couple of weeks time, and he'll talk about uh, dealing with estrogenic clovers. Uh, the other comment I'd make is it's important to select a subclover variety with a maturity that's suited to your district. And, and you'll get some good information on days to flowering if you go to you know, the seed company websites, whether that's uh, Seed Force or PTG Wrightson or Baron Brack. Uh, most of them, they will have the details there of the maturity of varieties. I I think, or I, I suggest you should avoid selecting too early a variety, a flowering variety, in the mistaken belief that the earlier varieties will produce more in winter or be more persistent. Uh, I'd recommend you select the latest possible maturing variety for your property and make sure you sow a mix of two or three varieties. And as I'll talk about later, the winter production and persistence are primarily determined by management rather than the variety. So the newer varieties are very good winter producers um, if, if they are managed properly. Um, so I'll just give an example there. That was a, a trial I sowed uh, last year and the variety, this is in about a 550 mil rainfall area. And the photo was taken in early November in the upper limestone coast area of South Australia. Uh, the variety on the left, they're finished, really finished growing in early October. So it's a very early variety. It was a Dow Keith type. And on the right hand side is Woodgenella, which is quite a bit later. You can see there that Woodgy is um, taking full advantage of the length of growing season and producing a lot more feed. Um, the two new brackies that I was I was involved with their um, pre with their uh, trial work before they were released and they've since been released and called uh, Tali and Antillo and I've had them in three paddock size replicated paddock trials this this last year and that was a photo of a site in the mid sort of part of the limestone coast in about a 650 mil rainfall area. And on the left there is Tali, and that's Lura, which also performed quite well, and then Monty on the right. And uh, Antillo is over right on the far left, you can't see that there. But both Antillo and Tali were significantly better uh, 
in dry matter production and in any of the other varieties in that trial. That's a pH of around, it's about neutral six and a half, six to seven pH. Um, so I think those two clovers really have some potential to extend the the range of um, subclover into the some of the alkaline soils, um, and particularly in areas where we're really struggling with persistence of clear and uh, antas. Um, both Tarly and Antillo have quite a lot of hard seed. Uh, they are very vigorous clovers. They I produce a lot of seed and their persistence has been really excellent. So before you sow a subclover, or the first job is to is to test your soil. Uh, you need to know what first of all you need to know what the pH is. Um, whether so which will determine whether you want to go with a you know with a bracky sort for the more alkaline soils, whether you go with a with a, a, a standard sub or a yeninicum. And also you need to know what your phosphorus, sulfur and potash, potassium levels are and uh, and then apply those if required. So noting that clovers are much more responsive than grasses to phosphorus, sulfur and potash. And those elements need to be in adequate supply if you're going to get the most out of your clovers. I'd recommend you so 10 kilos per hectare of freshly inoculated seed and that you control red-legged earth mite and loosened flea um, following establishment, even if you don't normally use insecticides in your other pastures. I think it, it's most important if you're going to be paying up to $8 a kilo for certified seed, you can't afford to lose any seed. And just recall or uh, Remember that your target is to take that 10 kilos of seed and turn it into 400 kilos in one year. If, if you can do that, then you're going to have a persistent and productive pasture for many years to come. But if you, if you only end up getting 50 kilos out of your 10 kilos, well then the pasture is really going to be struggling for the, for the, the subsequent years. So anything you can do to maximise both the establishment of uh, pasture plants and the production of seed, um, you need that's what you need to do. And keeping in mind that red-legged earth might do have a significant impact on seed production as well as as on the effect on dry matter production from seedlings. Um, if you are buying pre-coated clover seed, then make sure it's freshly coated and not last year's seed that's been stored up on a pallet close to an iron roof. I think um, if you are, if it's pre-coated, well then as I said, it needs to be freshly coated. Um, but, and all and I, all clover seed I think should be inoculated, even if you're sowing it into an old clover paddock, because the new, the new strains of inoculum, no, rhizobial inoculum contain the latest rhizobia strains that, that which are, which are more, um, more active than the than the older ones that just might have been in the paddock for years. Um, when sowing subclover, it's most important that you remove all the surface trash. You, I don't believe you need to spray the paddock before you sow, but you need to have the paddock clean of surface trash, uh, sow early and sow shallow um, with minimal soil disturbance, but making sure the seed is covered. And I'm not a fan of broadcasting seed. I know years ago there's been a lot of pastures established with mixing seed with super and broadcasting it either by air or through a broadcaster. But if you're probably lucky if you get 20% of that seed coming up and I think the way at the moment with the price of seed you've got to make sure every seed comes up and secondly there's a lot more competition in the paddocks now than what there was uh, 40 and 50 years ago. So the clovers have got to contend with, especially with annual grasses. So uh, yeah, I think if you put the seed in the ground, you're going to get um, a better germination. And uh, and also if the, it means you can sow early, so, and you can sow when things are warm. If you get a, if you've got a bit of a false break or a 
patchy start to the seeds and then if the seeds covered it's more likely to survive those false breaks so that's just a good example there of a particular photo i took in april um, of, a, of a pasture that was being sown you know direct drill with a disc sedum um, i think people tend to look after their uh, they tend not to graze their new pastures as much as they should so but provides the clovers have three to four trifoliate leaves, that's the true leaves, then they, you can start grazing. And I suggest that every year you should let your pastures, let your clover pastures establish two of that three to four trifoliate leaves before you graze. In other words, it's sort of a deferred grazing. And then once they've established, then just maintain enough grazing pressure to keep the pasture to about the height of a matchbox on its side is really perfect. So that's an example there. So matchbox on its side is is about where you need to be and no higher than a beer bottle on its side. So if you use that MLA um, uh, ruler there, that's probably a minimum of around 800 to 1,000 kilos and a maximum of 16 to 1,700 kilos. So that's, that's your target for ideal grazing of subclover pastures. And that pasture on the left there is a perfectly grazed pasture that I took in about early September. And you should maintain that sort of pressure. So that's, that's maybe two or three centimetres high. You should maintain that pressure right through flowering. <coughs> I couldn't actually find a really good slide of a of a flowering subclover pasture. So I substituted a lancer pasture there, but the same principle that you should in, when the pasture is flowering in spring, that's what you should see. You should see a mass of white flowers. And unfortunately, these days, you drive around paddocks in spring, you see very few paddocks, subclover paddocks with masses of white flowers. There's just too much feed in there, too many annual grasses too much and and too much leaf on the clover so keep them short and uh, and let them flower like that and obviously with a sub clover being a subterranean clover it buries its seeds and pushes it'll push the uh, flowers down into the ground uh, pretty quickly so the harder you graze the pasture in spring the more you're going to bury the seed and particularly if some varieties that don't like burying their seed being, don't bury seed normally. If you graze them harder, they will bury their seed deeper. Uh, just out a picture there to show that clover does not like shading. And that was also taken in spring. And you see on the, that's a path there, a sort of footpath through a paddock of velt grass. And uh, there's just velt and uh, sour sobs. The paddock's never been fertilised. The, um, down the middle there where the footpath was, there was just really good subclover, just really growing quite well there. Um, do not crash graze. I don't, it's by crash grazing, I mean putting big mobs of stock in there for a short time, uh, taking them out, letting the clover, letting the pasture regrow and then grazing again hard. I think probably clover pastures are really best actually set stocked at about the growth rate. So if your pasture is growing at 20 to 25 kilos per hectare per day, which it could be if it's a dense pasture in a fertile paddock, then that's 20 DSEs per hectare to keep up with the growth. So once the, once the pasture gets going, so once you've done that deferred grazing at the start of the season, then you can graze the paddocks quite hard. Obviously, with a new pasture, there's going to be a lot more bare ground and you've got to be a little bit of put and take there. But I would not spill the paddocks for too long. If it's a new pasture, um, put the stock in there as soon as you can. Um, the other important thing with pastures is to control crepe weed. I really, I think the grassy weeds can largely be controlled with spring grazing pressure. Uh, especially in a first year pasture. Um, but a cape weed, any of the shading plants, whether it's cape weed or um, geranium, uh, I'd recommend using a, just a low rate of uh, MCPA or MCPA mixed with some other products in a spray grazing technique. 
you see on the right hand side there that's been spray grazed and on the left hasn't. Uh, this was a paddock that that um, germinated in um, here late April and that photo was taken in early May, uh, in mid May 2020, uh, sorry it was taken in um, mid July but the paddock was sprayed in late May so it was about a month after it had germinated. So early spraying, if you've got broadleaf weeds, early spraying with a low rate of chemical and then followed by grazing. Um, avoid spray topping with glyphosate at any time if you want to maximise seed set um, in a clover pasture. Uh, if you need to spray top then you should should use um, paraquat because glyphosate is a translocated chemical and it does have quite a significant impact on seed production of uh, clover. So even though the clover might not obviously look affected, um, the chemical is translocated into the flowers and it does severely reduce seed production. Uh, definitely don't cut first year pastures for hay. A lot of people have first year pastures look really nice and they get tempted to cut them, um, graze them instead keep them nice and short to maximise uh, flowering. And over summer, don't let your sheep eat the clover burrs. Um, it's a bit of a learned habit from sheep and I know I know the clover burr is reasonably good quality feed, but at $8,000 a tonne, it's pretty expensive supplementary feed. And uh, if you're going to be, and I know if you, some clover pastures might have up to a thousand 1200 kilos of seed but the more seed you've got the more winter feed you get and if you're going to eat that seed over summer well that's eating into your winter feed production. That's, that's just a little graph there that shows um, you can see here this is um, a low density subclover pasture, a medium density and a high density and you can see that in June if you've got high density you're looking at probably four to five times as much feed as a medium density pasture. And this is a low density pasture, you're probably looking at probably 10 times as much feed. And so this high density, this is your, th this top line's a thousand plants per square metre. Um, at, so that's your 400 kilos of seed reserves. So that's where you need to be, that's where you need to be aiming at. And if you do that, if you're going to eat that seed over summer, well then, and bring it back to, um, to 50 to 100 kilos per hectare, well then um, that's where you'll be in winter. So in the year following the establishment of your subclover pasture, you should, you should be able to go into that paddock in the following autumn and put your hand down over any part of the paddock and you should be able to count eight subclover burrs under your hand. If you can do that, that's approximating 400 kilos of seed reserves, which is where you need to be, or the minimum where you need to be. That 400 kilos is going to give you your eight, your thousand plants per square metre. So that includes, that's allowing for the hard seeds that don't germinate and allowing for plants that die. And there are sub well managed subclover pastures right around southern Australia where they've measured 12 to 1500 kilos of seed reserves. And that's, that's, that's where you need to be. And uh, I'll just put a plug here for a colleague of mine, uh, Peter Schroeder, as some of you might know. Peter at Hamilton has written a book on uh, clover and that's available. Peter's got that available. If you care to ring him, um, he'll provide it for $30. And it's just got all the, just, he's, he's, he's been around for about as long as I have and he's just put all his thoughts into a book and there's just some really good tips there on managing and establishing and managing clover pastures. And uh, and that's only, it's only a short it's only a small book so and it's quite easy to read. And I think that's about it, Hilary. So I'm sort of hope I haven't gone too fast, but I guess uh, if there's some questions, um, I'm happy to take them on. Perfect. Thanks so much for that, Tim. It's really great to have some webinars when we get some really good rules of thumb uh, that people can certainly go away and apply 
Um, so thank you for that. And I certainly learned a heap so much. So I think I'm going to have to go back and re-listen. So that was fantastic. Thank you. I'll just give Tim a little bit. Sorry. I'll be up on the. I guess I guess that presentation will be up on the MLA website, and people can download yes, that's it. That's right. So the webinars are recorded and are available on the MLA website. This webinar should be up uh, either later tomorrow or Friday. Uh, so if anyone asks, they are recorded and are available on the MLA website under. Um, if you just Google MLA productivity and profitability webinars, you'll be able to find them. Uh, if you do have to head off early, you will be presented with a survey as you exit the webinar. If you could take two or three minutes to complete the survey, it would be great. It just provides feedback for presenters like Tim, the facilitators and MLA to make sure that the topics are relevant to the audience. So if you're right to go, Tim, there are a few questions. Yep. Oh, sure, yep that have come in. The first one, I might actually have to um, just send it to you via chat, but we'll see how we go. It's from Todd, um, his, uh, who is a seed rep um, in northern New South Wales, Queensland. Um, he just wants to, has a question regarding insecticide management during establishment of subclovers. He said, seed treated with poncho plus slash gorcho, sorry. Yep. Or, yep. equiv or equivalent, uh, is that sufficient or in crops insecticides or both? Uh, no, that gaucho um, is fine um, and that is, is a common ingredient in, in, in some of the proprietary uh, uh, coatings. Um, and that's a good way, that's a good way of treating the seed, um, especially it's, it's a non, um, you're not going to disadvantage any of your um, um, a natural predators that might be in the paddock. But the only comment I'd have is still, uh, even though your seed's treated, that doesn't, that doesn't mean you just sow it and then forget about it for two months. So I, I strongly recommend that you look at the paddock, it treat it like a crop and look at the paddock every, at least once a week, um, you know, for the first, uh, few weeks are until it's well established and particularly around the edges of the paddock if you don't want to walk into the paddock just have a look around the edges and just make sure there's nothing in there eating your plants when there could be it could be a few other things it could be a few other insects as well that might not be covered by uh, gaucho so uh, yeah you by all means use a, a gaucho a seed treatment but also look at the paddock at the same, uh, at the same time Wonderful, thank you. Thanks for the question, Todd. Uh, the next one is a good one from Jack. In southwest Victoria, where perennial ryegrass dominates, I have nowhere near the subclover densities you were talking about. How can subclover density be increased in a perennial ryegrass pasture? Yeah, no, that's thanks, Jack. Um, I yeah, I think if you follow those rules um, and get the graze the paddock out really hard in autumn. Um, I don't think you need to spray the paddock, um, but just graze it down really hard, and um, and then direct drill, direct you know direct drill your subclover with a disc seeder, and then then make sure and once it's once it germinates, make sure you graze it, and particularly in spring, I, I think the biggest issue with with uh, perennial grasses is is just they get out of control in spring and then shade the clover. So just like that photo I showed of the velt grass, um, the clover just doesn't like being shaded. So just graze it really hard in spring. And if you just do that, and I know you can't graze every paddock hard in spring, and uh, and there might be occasions when you need to let the paddocks go a bit. But if you're going to go to the trouble of sowing sub clover into a perennial ryegrass pasture, then that paddock should have priority for you know, hard grazing. So no more than you know, no more than a stubby on its side. Don't let it get higher than that in spring. And the other interesting thing is that if you do that, um, there's some trial work that was done in Western Australia quite a few years ago that indicated that keeping the pastures down to 1,500 kilos per hectare in spring was as good as two sprays the following year for red-legged earth mite. 
just really incredible that by keeping the pastures short in spring, you significantly reduce the egg laying ability of a red mite and, and they are much less of a problem the following year. That's great, thank you. Thanks, Jack. Did you have something else to add, Tim? Sorry. No, no, no. Hopefully that's answered okay. Jack's question. But I think maintaining clover in perennial, in any perennial grass pastures is a bit of a struggle. And particularly as a lot of the perennial grass pastures get rotationally grazed, which means that they, they tend to go from, yeah, at times the year they get too rank and that doesn't really suit the clovers. Thank you. Um, the next question from Michael, how much damage can crickets do to the seed bank and the best way to control them? Okay. Yeah, no, thanks, Michael. I, um, yeah, crickets are extremely damaging. If you look, uh, you probably noticed if you look along the cracks in those heavy soils with crickets, um, there's, um, there's no seed whatsoever along the, the edges there. So they are quite very damaging. So worth, you're yeah, worth, if you've got crickets worth controlling. Um, I might leave that to your local agronomist, but basically bait, you can bait them um, or there are some sprays as well, but uh, I won't buy into the insecticides, but there are, there are a range of uh, good insecticide options, which you can either spray or use as a bait. Great, thank you. Uh, the next one from David. Does any of your advice change if you consider lower rainfall zones and lower pH soil areas? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, I reckon the principles are still the same. I mean, I've I, I've got clients down into that sort of three thirty mil rainfall area. Um, I think the principles are exactly the same. You may you may choose if you're down, I'm not sure, David, what rainfall you're talking, but if say you're talking 330, 340 mil, you might perhaps bring your seeding rates back to five kilos per hectare. Um, I would still, I'm really wary of, I reckon like there's a couple of varieties that subclover varieties that are really early. I reckon Nungaran's one, and there's a couple of others that, and I reckon they are just a little bit too early, even in those low rainfall areas. Um, but but if you if but I guess you can still put Nungaran in, but add a couple of you know slightly later ones in there, whether you went Daliac or depending on the soil or Seaton Park or just a slightly later one in there as well, because I I think we do have a well, I've seen quite a few issues of paddocks that where the the, the clovers just they don't, they, they just die before, whilst it's still raining. And I reckon that's just pretty wasteful. Mm, thanks for the question, David. Uh, the next one is the last one from Mark. So if you have any more questions, please do get them in. Um, this question's also a little bit broad, but see how you go, Tim. You've largely discussed sub-management in terms of a monoculture. What about management in a mixed clover grass pasture with say Coxfoot or Phalaris? Oh yeah, no, that's uh, yes, yeah. Um, I guess I was focusing focusing as a monoculture because really the emphasis should be in that first year of actually turning that ten kilos of seed into four hundred. Um, but I'm well aware that that clover is always going to be, or most times it'll be in with the grass. I think the same principles apply. Was it Jack that? asked about sowing into perennial ryegrass. So um, I think the key thing, if you if you got Coxfoot and Phalaris and and uh, perennial ryegrass is to make sure the paddock has sufficient pressure on there in spring. Now you, you can't do every paddock um, every year, but I reckon probably every four years, you should make sure those clover paddocks get a good hiding in spring. Um, down to, as I said, down to the, you know, stubby on its side and down low enough that you can actually see the flowers. If you can't see flowers in your paddock in spring, then you're not grazing it hard enough. And uh, and I don't believe that has a, 
I think doing that every four years or five years is not, and if you do that early enough in spring, I don't believe you're actually affecting your perennials at all. Um, because once the clover finishes flowering, then you can lighten the, you can lighten the load off and give the perennials a chance to recover. But the key thing is getting that seed production there. Excellent. Thank you for the question. And that seems to be all for this evening, uh, unless there's any that come through really, really quickly. No. If, yeah, if people, I certainly recommend Peter Schroeder's book if you just want a little, you know, a little 50 page book on establishing clover and managing clover. And if you're a member of the Grassland Society of Southern Australia, we've got, I've got an article there on the trial work we've done with uh, Antillo and Tali and some other clover varieties that's going to be published in the next couple of weeks. Excellent. There's just been one more come in, Tim, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, yeah, no, not from a problem. Trevor, do different varieties vary with bloat in cattle? No, I'm not, I'm not sub clovers, no. Um, I think there's probably a difference between different clover varieties, like white clover is probably a bit more prone to causing bloat, say, than sub clover. Um, uh, where, but as far as the sub clover is concerned, I'm not aware of any differences between varieties. Um, potentially there could be because I know some of the newer, like the Bracky types and certainly the um, Antillo and Antas and uh, Tali are quite upright growing varieties and probably a bit more accessible to stock. But I've, I've not noticed any more bloat with those. But as I think a number of you have pointed out already, the clover is generally grown in, is not usually grown in a monoculture, it's usually grown in a mix you know, with a with a grass, and that tends to safen it a bit. But I guess if it was a monoculture of especially some of those uh, brackies, then potentially there could be some issues. Thanks for the question, like, Tim. Oh, sorry. Jim. Yeah. yeah, there's a fair bit of research going on at MLA at the moment with regards to bloat. So watch this space. Okay, that seems to be all for this evening. So thanks very much again, Tim, for presenting tonight. There's plenty of take homes. Um, and again, if anyone does ask for the recording, it's on the MLA website. Should be up by tomorrow afternoon. Thanks everyone for uh, tuning in. Um, I will see you in three weeks time with a uh, webinar with Caroline Jacobson looking at dystopia in news. Okay, thanks everyone. So still there, Hillary, is that? Yep, I am. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Just, so uh yeah, hope that